Well, first of all, Captain Moore, um, how did you first discover the Pacific Garbage Patch? Well, I would uh, entered the 1997 Transpac from Los Angeles to Honolulu to test a new rig, a new mast on my vessel. And uh, on the way there, it's a straight line, run line race, a uh, downhill, a lot of spinnaker sailing. But on the way back, you beat north to around 40 degrees and get the westerly winds traditionally. But I was a research vessel, I had extra fuel, so I decided to take a, a shortcut at my latitude, the latitude of Los Angeles, 35 north, and head uh, through the doldrums, which most sailors avoid. But uh, by doing that, I exposed myself to this uh, uh, garbage patch. Uh, we didn't know it existed at the time, but I couldn't come on deck without seeing some form of plastic floating by, not large objects. I never really entered them in the log. I didn't consider them a threat to navigation, but I experienced this feeling of surprise that this area as far from human civilization as you can get was littered. This area is nearly as large as the United States itself. You cross it over a week's time doing 150 miles a day, and uh, you don't have the pieces touching one another. They're just dispersed bits of broken plastic floating on the surface of the ocean. So it's not really a patch. It's more like a soup of plastic that is existing in this area simply because it's calm and the currents tend to concentrate it there. So is there, there more than one of them? There are five of these subtropical gyres and each of them have their garbage patches. The North and South Atlantic, the North and South Pacific, and the Indian Ocean all have these subtropical gyres. They're the equivalent of oceanic deserts and roughly equivalent to the latitude of terrestrial deserts on Earth. How dangerous is it? Well, in terms of wildlife, uh, they're dangerous because juveniles go there to grow large. They're not where top predators are because they don't have an abundance of life. They're oceanic deserts. So it's a threat to the developing uh, wildlife. It's also a threat to uh, the developing albatross because they're on a nest at a remote island. Their parents are soaring over these garbage patches looking for detritus. The, the albatross is kind of like the vulture of the sea. And they pick up bits and pieces and regurgitate them to their chicks. So. We're, we're threatening reptiles, the turtles, we're threatening birds. And in our study of fish, we looked at 671 of the small fish that live in this area. On an average, 35% of them had two pieces of plastic in their stomachs. Now this is not just non-digestible and non-nutritive, it's also toxic because the plastics absorb pollutants from the sea. So where does the plastic actually come from? I don't know that we can isolate the source uh, the source is what we call non-point source. There's not a single point that's generating this debris. It's coming from the world as a whole. And there are seven billion of us now. None of us are immune from the plastic culture that has developed around us. The age of plastic sort of surreptitiously has engulfed us and now everything comes wrapped in it. We wear it, we sit in it, we upholster our furniture with it, uh, our carpets are made out of it. And we're all generating plastic waste. So this non-point source pollution comes from ships, comes from shore. We don't know the exact proportions, but they're all contributing. So what should we be doing? Uh, what we should be doing is having uh, a rethinking of plastic in our lives, only using those plastics that have an afterlife, that have an end game, that have a take back infrastructure and what will happen if we don't stem this tide of plastic running into the sea is we're going to start crashing some of the very fundamental building blocks of the ocean biome. And what would that mean for, for us as a species? Well, it certainly screws up seafood, you know. Uh, seafood, we want it uh, to be healthy. I mean, we know that the oils that are in seafood, the proteins that are in seafood, are easily digestible and healthy foods. But we're polluting those with uh, what we call the POPs, the persistent organic pollutants, and a lot of them are transmitted by plastic. So we're, we're damaging our own 
health by polluting with plastic. We need individual action, we need governmental action, and we need action by industry. We need design for recycling, uh, we need better chemistry, we need good chemists to produce non-toxic additives to plastic and non-toxic plastics. We need the efforts of the entire human race uh, in every capacity since every human on the planet is part of the problem. They all are going to have to be part of the solution. It's non-point source pollution. You're visiting New Zealand with the Sir Peter Blake Trust. I would guess this is something that Sir Peter would have been passionate about. There's no question but what Peter and I have seen that the ocean is now the most common surface feature is plastic pollution. Uh, you, say, you can't sail around the ocean anymore without seeing plastic. You, you may go to sea in hopes of seeing a whale or seeing a dolphin, uh, seeing some beautiful marine creature. You're not guaranteed you're going to see that. You are guaranteed you're going to see trash. This is the unfortunate reality, and I know Sir Peter Blake would have been, as I am, a crusader for keeping it out of the ocean.